my connection is that my great great aunt Charlotte Collier went on the ship with her husband Harvey and her daughter Marjorie. Uh, they lived at Bishop Stoke, which is near Southampton, and he was a grocer there. But sadly, uh, Charlotte had developed TB and was was going to die at some stage. So they decided to sell their shop and pack everything up and uh, emigrate to America, to the USA. And they had, I think they'd bought some land, but they hadn't um, got much further in a place called Payette in Idaho, where they were going to have a peach farm in the hope that the warmer climate would prolong Charlotte's life. Um, and they... Uh, were recommended taking this brand new ship, which was the Titanic. And they had all of their furniture in the hold. And uh, they went to the bank just before they left and Harvey drew out all of their savings. And he was offered a banker's draft, but he declined and said he wanted the, to have the cash. So he actually had, we think he had about $5,000 in his breast pocket. And um, off they went on board and their friends came to see them, say goodbye to them. And um, they uh, had quite a pleasant early cruise, I think. Um, Harvey sent a letter to his parents from Queenstown saying what a fine time they were having and how wonderful the ship was and um, the food was amazing and... Uh, they would feel sorry when they got to the States because they were only travelling third class when they got to America, whereas they were second class on the ship. Um, and then, of course, um, the iceberg was struck and um, Charlotte and Marjorie had gone to bed by that time and were, were sleeping in the cabin. Um, and Harvey, they felt the ship, they were talking when the ship struck and they felt it sort of judder and the engine stop and um, Harvey went out to see what was happening and he came back a few minutes later and said oh um, we've, we've struck an iceberg but you know apparently it's nothing to worry about they just said go back to your cabins and um, he said that he'd seen he'd been through the saloon and he'd seen some card players who'd been playing cards and when the ship struck all their cards fell on the ground but they just picked them up and carried on playing and you know he he was satisfied that there was nothing to worry about so he came back to the cabin and they were just sitting and talking and then all of a sudden they just heard the sound of hundreds and hundreds of footsteps going past their door and they're looking out they could see that, that all these people were just leaving and um, so they suddenly felt oh you know this isn't Things are a bit more serious than we thought, but they were sure that it was nothing and that they'd probably come back to the cabin. So um, Marjorie just was in her night, uh, Charlotte was in her nightie, and she just put a white star bolster thing around her cabin blanket around her and wrapped Marjorie in another blanket. And um, uh, Harvey left his watch on the pillow because he was sure they were coming back. And Marjorie left her favourite doll in the cabin. And um, off they went up to the deck. And they were just standing there, milling about with everybody, not really sure what was going on. And then all of a sudden, a stoker came up from below. And he had all the fingers of one of his hands had been chopped off. And he was black, you know, black with coal, but just kind of covered with blood as well. And he was sort of staggering about saying, you know, this ship's going down, it's, a, it's horrible down there, um, you know, there's water. And, and, and at that point, they realised that, that actually this, this was much more serious and, and, you know, the ship was probably going to sink. Um, and then things started to get a bit more frantic and the lifeboats were being uh, started to be lowered and... Um, they were saying women and children first and Charlotte didn't want to be separated from Harvey. So they watched a couple of the lifeboats fill and empty, you know, and, and the first lifeboat, I think she said, filled quite quickly because that was filled with people who didn't mind getting off. Uh, but then when it came to the second lifeboat, nobody wanted to get in it because they were having to leave their husbands behind. 
So that one filled much more slowly. And then that went away. And then um, the deck started to tilt and it became obvious that, you know, things were going madly wrong. Um, but still, they didn't want to be separated because they were very much lived for each other. And um, they were standing looking at another lifeboat, lifeboat number 14, when a sailor came and he grabbed hold of Marjorie, the little girl, and threw her into the lifeboat. And then Charlotte still was hanging on to her husband, didn't want to be parted from him. But the sailor grabbed her by the waist and threw her in as well. And so, she, and you know, it meant that Marjorie, the little girl, never really got to say goodbye to her dad. And, the, and Harvey, the dad, said, just be brave, be brave. I'll find another boat. I'll get in another boat. And then he just turned and walked through the crowd and they never saw him again. And then the boat started to be lowered. Um, and then a very sad thing happened. A, a young lad of about 12 who'd been waiting and waiting to get on uh, tried to get on the boat and he jumped. He jumped as it was starting to go. And uh, some of the women hid, tried to hide him with their skirts because he was only, he was literally, they think about 12 or 13. And the officer Lowe, who was in charge of the boat, pulled a pistol and pointed it at the boy's head and said, get back on the ship. Um, and the boy was begging, you know, to be saved. And the lady, all the ladies were crying and Marjorie was hanging on to Officer Lowe saying, please don't shoot, please don't shoot him. And um, basically he sort of lowered his pistol and he said, get back on the ship, you've got to get back on um, because we, we, we're probably going to have to pick up passengers lower down and it's women and children. So this little lad got back on the ship and he just lay down on a coil of rope because he was, you know, in just in despair and he wasn't saved. And then they went lower down and as they went past the third class um, deck, a man jumped, did a running jump and jumped into the lifeboat and he apparently crushed a child uh, as he fell in and he was sort of thrown back out by the sailors and beaten up apparently as he got back on the ship by a load of men just beat him up because he'd broken the code you know which was that you didn't rush the lifeboats and then anyway the, the lifeboat just kind of shot down after that and actually hit the sea with a big splash. They didn't pick up any more women or children. Um, I think there was something like 52 people on that lifeboat, something like that. They rowed away from the ship um, and they could see it, you know, with all the lights blazing. Um, it was very cold. Um, they kept rowing and as they watched the... There was a big explosion in the ship, which Charlotte, you know, mentions very, she's sort of uh, very articulate about it. She says that a great big fan of sparks shot up straight from the ship and it broke in half. And then the sparks came down like a sort of red fountain. And at that point, she says she could still see the lights were still on and she saw the the back end, I think it was, I'm not quite sure, of the ship break away and just sink very quickly. And the lights went out at that point. And then the, the stern, is it, the front, rose up. And she describes that. And she could see people on the decks all hanging on. And then that, you know, that went into the water. And then at that point, they heard, they heard the screaming start as all the people fell into the freezing sea. And they begged the uh, they begged the officer to take the lifeboat back, but he wouldn't. He said if they went back, they'd be swamped. So then they rowed around, and he m found several other lifeboats, and they tied themselves together. Um, and then he distributed passengers from his lifeboat, which was lifeboat fourteen, um, into the other boats, and. Um, Basically, Marjorie and Charlotte were still in his boat. He was called Officer Lowe. And then they rowed back. I think they were the only boat that went back to look for survivors. But by then it was 
about an hour later. And I think something like 1,500 people went into the sea. And when they went back an hour later, they found four living people. That was it. Everybody else had died. It was just far too late, you know, by then. But they did have... So they found uh, a lifeboat that had, um, hadn't been launched properly. It had obviously come off, floated off the deck as the ship went down, and it was on its on its key, what's, you know, the keel was uppermost, and it had about twenty men lying along it, and they found that, and I think four of the men were dead, but the rest they rescued, and they also found a the they thought was a Japanese man lashed to a door that was floating. And um, the officer said, oh, I mean, it's, it's you know, of its time. He said, oh, there's, you know, better worth saving than a Jap and wasn't going to save him because uh, they thought he was dead anyway because the water was, was actually lapping over him and he was frozen and he wasn't moving. But the women begged him to go just to check. So they went and they checked on this guy and actually he was conscious. So they cut him loose and pulled him into the boat and the women chafed his hands and feet. And then he suddenly kind of sprang to life and um, the set, one of the sailors was very tired by this time with all the rowing. And this, this chap sort of pushed him out the way and rowed all night, you know, without stopping and was just amazing. And then, and the officer said something, something like, "By Jove, I wish, you know, I wish I could have found more such men or something." Um, so then, after that, they just, you know, sat on the ocean waiting for help to come. Um, Marjorie's account, who's the little girl, she, it's quite interesting. Her account is different to Charlotte's because Charlotte was. It was very cold. They had their feet in, war, you know, freezing cold water. They were wearing nighties with just these thin cabin blankets. And Charlotte, I think, was fainting and, uh, you know, she had TB. She was quite a frail lady anyway. And she fainted, the mother this is, and she had her hair loose, obviously, because she'd gone to bed. And her hair fell into the... Uh, against a sailor and it got caught in the I think it's called the row row lock where the oar you know rests in, and he actually pulled out a great chunk of her hair so and um there's a photograph of the pair of them at the on the Carpathia the next day sitting in their 90s with their cabin blankets and you can see that Charlotte's hair is all kind of ragged at one side where this happened um and Marjorie describes how the women were silent. Nobody spoke. They were very cold. Uh, it went, you know, it was hours of just this silence and these kind of exhausted people. Um, and then she says that somebody said they thought they could see a ship, the light of a ship on the horizon, but she thought it was just another star because there were so many stars out that night. But it, it got bigger and bigger, and then she realised it was a ship. Um, the whole time that she was in the boat, she was, she said she cried sometimes, this is Marjorie, the little girl, because she'd left her dolly, and there was nobody there to mind it, and it was getting wet. Um, she was sure that her dad would be on another boat somewhere. Um, so they rowed across to the Carpathia, they think it was about four miles that they had to row, which took a long time. And then uh, when they got there, the women had to climb up. All they had was rope ladders. So these poor women had to climb up these rope ladders. But the children just couldn't make it. So what they did was they got some US mail sacks, emptied the letters out and lowered these sacks and then put the children in the sacks, tied them up and just pulled them up the side of the ship. And then... Um, Basically, they had this awful next few hours hoping and hoping that sh that Harvey would would appear, um, that he'd be on one of these other boats, but he wasn't. And they then had, I think, a couple of days of 
um, on the Carpathia and they had to sail through a really rough storm, which was pretty frightening for them all. Uh, and they were sleeping on the floor. Obviously, there was no beds for them or anything. Still in their 90s. And then they came into New York and I think I find this quite crass of the White Star Line. They made the Carpathia go first to the to the pier where the Titanic would have docked and unload all of the Titanic's lifeboats because they belonged to the White Star Line and they wanted them back. So the passengers had to stand there watching while the lifeboats were unloaded. And there's a photo, I, I don't have it, a great photo of this sailor just standing on this pier with all these lifeboats just kind of piled on it. Uh, and then the ship sailed round to its actual birth, the Carpathia's birth, and they got off and there was just press and this big melee of people. Um, and they had some friends who'd already bought a peach farm in Idaho and they'd obviously heard the news and the husband had come to New York and he had he found Charlotte and Marjorie and he had uh, secured a room for them in a hotel with, with um, you know, food and warm clothes. But Charlotte became very ill with pneumonia because, you know, they'd basically had exposure, I think, from the cold. And um, she became very ill and she was taken in by an, a wealthy New York doctor who looked after her and Marjorie until Charlotte was well. Um, and then uh, Charlotte gave the interview to the Chicago Sunday Tribune, which is why I know this story, That because that's the story I've just told you. And Marjorie also gave an interview. Um, and they basically thought that they would go on to the fruit, to the fruit farm um, and they got some. They were given some money from the Titanic Fund and from the newspaper article, and just very kindly, New York people gave them clothes. They gave Marjorie a new doll. I think the children in the street where she was staying all clubbed together and bought her a brand new doll. And there's this lovely picture of her with this doll. Um, and then they went to Idaho. I think they were there probably just a couple of months and it you know Charlotte was still ill they had no money really it wasn't going to work so they ended up I think about three months after originally setting sail they ended up coming back to Bishop Stoke uh, basically ended up where they'd begun but with nothing um, I think they got from the American the Americans actually gave them I think something like in the end, all the fundraising that was done on their behalf, they ended up with about uh, $2,000, which sounds quite a lot. I mean, it probably was, but um, they, that, that was all they had. You know, Harvey was dead, so they had no breadwinner. Sh uh, Marjorie, Charlotte was ill. So they, I think they lived quite carefully. Uh, Charlotte then, after about two years, Charlotte, quickly remarried she was dying but she remarried in the hope that Marjorie would be cared for by the new husband but Charlotte then died in I think she died in 1916 leaving Marjorie orphaned at age 12 by then and this new husband didn't want to care for Marjorie so she was made a ward of court and went to live with family um, and um, she received money from the Titanic Fund till she was 18, and then that was the end of it. Um, she got she went to boarding school, and she married quite young at 23. Uh, but then, very sadly, her little boy died when he was a baby, and then her husband died um, shortly afterwards uh, when Marjorie was 39. And then she was alone, and she, because she had no siblings, you know, parents were dead, and she lived very, she had a very difficult time actually financially. She never really, she lost everything, that ship really took everything from her. Um, and she just had this very, very sad actually, lonely life. Um, she was interviewed in the 50s by Walter Lord when he wrote 
who was writing his book, A Night to Remember. And I have a letter that she wrote saying how kind he was and what a lovely man he was and that he had decided that he would try and speak to the Titanic trustees who were looking after the money that was given by the public for the survivors' benefits to see if she was entitled to, to get any more money from them. And at the same time, my aunt, who's still alive, also went and had an interview with the Titanic trustees in Holborn. But because Charlotte had remarried just before she died, they said that she had, in effect, replaced Harvey, the dead father, and so she wasn't entitled to anything, even though she was actually destitute because of the ship. I think, well, I never knew Marjorie. Obviously, my mum and my aunt knew her, and um, they, you know, they did find the whole thing pretty sad. It wasn't talked about very much at the time, and Marjorie, I know, preferred not to talk about it. Um, in the letter that I have from her, she says, you know, how that ship has dogged her life, which I think she calls it. And she, you know, she was kind of sick of the whole thing. And so we didn't, it wasn't something that we talked about at length. But when the ship was found in 85, that was when I became interested in in the whole thing and I think that was when my aunt went and found this account again from, and from now us. we're a hundred years on from the the sad events of April 1912 how do you think we should reflect upon what's happened um, I think it's important not to forget that you know it was a tragedy for those involved because I think people get swept up in the glamour of it all and the fact that it was this beautiful ship on its maiden voyage and it had all these rich famous people on board and the Astors and all of these people and you know there were lots of other people on board and uh you know quite a few of them never got off you know or went down with went down with the ship and were killed and it was a massive tragedy and I think uh certainly some of the things you see today are really tasteless you know think you can get Titanic paperweights where the ship's sort of halfway sunk and um, people have Titanic parties. I know people had quite a few New Year's Eve Titanic parties this year because it's the centenary year. But I think that's just really tasteless. Um, it's a bit like having a, you know, Herald of Free Enterprise party or, you know, a Costa Concordia party or something. It's just, it's not right because so many people died on that ship. How should we mark it this year in particular? Um, I think we should remember, we should remember it uh, and we should remember the survivors' stories and the stories of those who didn't survive. But above all, we should remember the people and we should think about them. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the ship itself, it is incredible lying there on the bottom of the ocean. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a grave, that ship, and it should be left, I think. You know, OK, they've been and explored it, but the thing that I always remember with that ship is it's got a sea of boots and shoes around it from where all the people came to rest. And, you know, it, it, should, be, it should be remembered that, you know, that ship took and changed so many lives when it struck the iceberg. Um, it's not the ship's fault it was human error and um that's very relevant today isn't it with with what's just happened a few weeks ago and i think we we kind of constantly do that as humans don't we <laughs> just forget ourselves and forget that you know the sea is a dangerous place and um you should treat it with respect <laughs>